had Amanda chance to convince us that robots are the future of general surgery. I hope that's the plan. Is it? Yep. I don't know. All right, cut the guys, please. Dr. Hall. Thank you, Dr. Jokovic. Uh, there are two main objectives today. Number one is I just want to give you an overview of what's going on with robotic surgery in case you didn't pay attention. And, but more importantly, I would like to formally introduce Dr. Amanda Ferris, who is the first fellow for the Surgical Education and Simulation Fellowship at our institution, one of the only 10 ACS accredited uh, program under the leadership of Dr. Sarsito. I have nothing to do with that. I just happened to find out and take advantage of her. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and then the rest of it is the uh, routine uh, objective. I will, I will uh, trim some of the facts, but Robot has been uh, introduced to our uh, surgical practice since 1985. And if you go through this, one of the things uh, for those of us at Sacramento need to remember that as far back as 1992, the RoboDot actually was invented in Sacramento by one of our orthopedic surgeons who went out to private practice after that. Um, but later on, ASOP is another development that basically funded by the defense uh, department. And nowadays, we still have that. And then by the turn of the century, the first two robotic system has been approved by the FDA, which is the Zeus and the Da Vinci. At the beginning, we have to decide between the two. And the Da Vinci was first approved by the FDA to, to perform prostatectomy in 2001. It made by surgical, uh, intuitive surgical in Sunnyvale. At the same time, computer motion uh, developed the Zoot, and they have a public relation uh, coup by performing the first transatlantic laparoscopic goalie between New York City and somewhere in Paris. Uh, we chose the Zoot. And as you can tell, the two different here, if you do the Da Vinci, the surgeon is stuck into the console and never get a chance to see anything else. But the reason for that is the 3D visualization. If you do the Zeus, and the way when we went to try it out, it looked like you're sitting down there and driving a Ferrari. <laughs> so we chose that. In any event, um, surgical, uh, intuitive surgical fi finally acquired computer motion and the Zeus technology was shelved. So nowadays, you only have one commercial available system, which is the Da Vinci platform. There's many things that you can talk about how uh, good it is in terms of the surgeon. And le let me just skip that. But as of September 2008, there's about 4 1,800 systems worldwide, about 65% of those in the U.S., and the rest is in Europe and Asia. So you can see that it continues to develop. Now, what is the pro and con of robotic surgery? From the point of view of a surgeon, you have total control of your visualization. You have 3D dimension. You can digitally zoom in. It's stable, and you look at what you want to look instead of asking somebody to move it. It also allows you to operate with both hands. That's why the term intuitive. Your right hand will be your right hand when you look at it, and your left hand will be your left hand. You always look forward. You don't look backward. You can't. And that, uh, how many times you do a laparoscopic procedure and you try to get the thing like picking your nose? Doesn't work. Um, it also eliminate any hand tremor, and for a surgeon, you can operate even if you cannot walk. And lastly, <laughs> it's been proven that you can do telesurgery. One of the original ideas why you develop this is the Department of Defense would like to see you can operate in the biofield with some expertise of somewhere else. So telementoring is possible with the robotic system. The Kansai, which is whenever you casually talk about it, this is the first thing people bring up. And then 
when they bring up this thing, then you know the conversation should be politely stopped there because there's no way you can argue against it. It costs half a million dollars to two and a half million dollars to buy one. Then it costs you somewhere $200,000 a year just to maintain it. And then every time you use something, uh, you're going to cost about 200 bucks every time you lock one of those in, and they only can be used 10 times. So that the average 200, 250. So on the average, if you decide to do a robot, the system alone will cost you somewhere between 700 to 3,500. And then, you, uh, for those of who, uh, those of you who use robot, be careful. Don't don't just ask for things to be available and undo it because you can only sterilize the thing that you haven't used to a maximum number of times. The last time I was told is 15. In other words, you want that, but you're not using it, and you ask them to open it up, 15 times, things are gone. You can't use it again. So be mindful about the cost. Anyway, the way I keep saying is that if you decided to buy a Ferrari, then the service and the fuel is going to be expensive. This is the ethical cost of robotic surgery on the average. When you look at between robotic laparoscopic versus conventional, on the average, it's about 10 to 25 percent more expensive. Hysterectomy is probably the lowest increase in cost. But overall, you can see the picture. Um, we talk about this a lot. The, one of the things that uh, people are always mention is that because the robot is currently under one uh, monopoly leader in the market, uh, it's very hard to try to drive down the cost. That may change in the future. In any event, at the current time, and tomorrow they will formally confirm that and let us know, is that we have three uh, XI robot system, which is the fourth generation, the newest one. And we have a bunch of console and patient car, as you see here. And then we have one extra new uh, single port system specifically for colorectal surgery to do the, uh, the TAMIS and uh, ENT to do transoral procedure. There are many things to be available, but it's not FDA approved. And I think tomorrow night I will talk about that. Um, how do I get into the robot? I remember at the turn of the century, I was among one of the faculty who accompanied Dr. Goodnight to go down to Santa Barbara and check out the system. I, I tag along because I want to travel. And at that time, we decided to buy the Zeus system. But because it's only one system and limited access to the system, uh, the division decided that the robot should be limited to Dr. Nguyen, who pioneer the uh, bariatric surgery. So I want to wait, do something else. And when I fumble with the conventional single site, uh, single port laparoscopic cholestectomy, it was quite frustrated when you use your right hand, but you cut on the left side, and you're confused, and you become an unpopular attendant because the resident is also wonder why you choose to do single port and so on. So, so I decided to uh, revisit robotic surgery to see what they're up to. Turned out that they developed a system for that purpose. So by 2012, UC Davis was chosen to be among the first launch hospital for the procedure. But for some various reason, I wasn't able to operate but end up screening all the patients for Dr. Bilofsky and some for Dr. Ali to do the first series. But uh, I'm not operating, doesn't mean that I wouldn't go to the OR. So I spent basically a fellowship for three months sitting in the OR watching Dr. Bidowski mainly and then Dr. Lee sometime because we have conflict in clinic uh, to watch the case. Well, that brings up one thing I want to send a message to the resident. You may not like the robot, but you cannot do it right now. And you don't want to find some excuse not to be in there because from the last 30 years in my career, I learned one thing. 
Watching is the critical part of learning. If you don't watch, you have no clue. And then when you get to do it, you fumble and you miss your chance. So think about it. That will lead up to the... So what happened in the last three or four years, I decided to tackle the robot. And I can tell you one thing, for practical purpose, there is no case that I won't be able to do it with the robot. Thing that you used to do open and you're reluctant to do laparoscopically, now I can do it. I can list for the more than two, 300 cases, all the things that I've done, um, even colidocal cystectomy, all the partial gastrectomy, wheel rock one, wheel rock two, you can always do it. Intercorporeal, extracorporeal, they have everything for you. So believe me, if you want to do it, you can do it. Um, I do not have experience with thoracic, the pancreas, it's off, and the endocrine, uh, simply because that's not part of my practice anymore. Okay. One, another thing I learned during that time is that being the person who screened the patient, convinced the patient, and got subject to their question, how many times did you do None. <laughs> okay. Have you ever seen this? None. Do you have any experience with this? None. And then somehow I get the patient to accept it. <laughs> but then <laughs> what is their main concern? The main concern that the patients say is that, why should I trust a robot to do the operation and not you? Well, it turn, turn out is that there is a disservice to the public when we chose the term robot. What they thought, and patients still do, is that I'm going to go somewhere, take a nap, and then tell some robot doing it. OK? And I have to explain to them that this is computerized instrumentation, which is similar to any computerized system that has been used in our everyday life, such as the management of nuclear power plant, the autopilot and jetliner. You know, you know that every time you land it there, the pilot is sitting there watching unless they want to take over. It's actually autopilot. And it's proven to be much safer and more reliable. So the question is that, can you do the same thing to make surgery uh, safer? Of course, yeah. Have you get to the point that you actually have a robot doing it and you're going to some, do something else? Not really, but it may be in the future. Uh, but that might take years. On the other hand, you need to be aware that if you look at the autonomous driver, I mean, the autonomous dri uh, driving car, you can see how fast it goes. So look into the future, you're going to have to be prepared for that. Um, I was about, well, let me do this. I actually did an extensive surgical, I mean, literature search for the last year, see what up with the robot, and virtually in every field from lung cancer down to uh, colorectal surgery, you have a lot of studies showing that. So the bottom line is I'm going to go through the highlight and skip a few because I want to go to the training part. For lung cancer, it compared to the uh, between the robot, uh, be, between the robot, the MIS, and the open surgery, open lobectomy have higher readmission rate, higher mortality, higher index of hospital cost, and longer length of stay. When you if you do the robotic lobectomy, it does cost you more, and compared to laparoscopic, it does have more pulmonary complication, although it's not that high. But unanimously, if you do a robotic lobectomy, the chance of you sending the patient home is much higher instead of a nursing home or, or some kind of rehab. Um, Similar thing, except that it costs more, but it less plus a lot for esophageal cancer and gastric cancer. Um, again, you can virtually do a robotic total gastrectomy with everything done inside the abdomen. You don't even uh, pull it out because with the 
the junction, you can't really pull it out and do an extracorporeal anastomosis, and it's hands on. Uh, regarding gastroesophageal reflux disease, there's no question about it. If you do it with a robot, you minimize the incident of uh, perforation to the esophagus and the stomach. And in this study, there are two patients who require ICU stay because of mediastinitis, both of them in the laparoscopic uh, group, and they, uh, one of them need torchotomy. And the esophageal perforation was not recognized. If you look at the way the robot allows you to manipulate the angle of your instrumentation, will, you will appreciate why you avoid those kind of complications. And then for obesity, uh, the, the, the application of robot in obesity so far is about 7%. And most of the studies show that it does cost more. Um, Another one. So let, let me go to this thing. So then a lot of people are going to say that uh, why do you need the robot? I can do it with a stick, uh, the straight stick, the laparoscopic. That's the argument of those who very well work in laparoscopic surgery. That's not the point. The point is that if you look at this study and check on the, fel the fellow who finished colorectal surgery, those who have robot training tend to do more minimally invasive cases, and they do not cannibalize the cases from the laparoscopic case. They're more willing to tackle the case that they think cannot be done laparoscopically and not apply to, um, to robotic things, okay? So if you look at rectal cancer, a meta-analysis has shown that robotic surgery in rectal cancer has a lower conversion rate, although it has a longer operating time. But from the oncologic uh, management, it has similar mortality, number of margin involvement, and the limb node collected. As a matter of fact, some of the colorectal surgeons would say robotic surgery for rectal cancer should be the standard of care. Uh, what about colorectal surgery and obesity? There's no question about it. This, in this study, looking at two-year data from the American College of Surgery, NIFSQUIT, it's shown that robotic colorectal surgery will lower the conversion rate compared to open, it, I mean, compared to laparoscopic alone. It decreased the length of stay, and it decreased the prolonged post-op earlier. So you take it or leave it. Um, lastly, on a mass analysis of uh, 169,000 patients, it confirmed what we're all talking about. Longer time to operate, but less conversion to open, less mortality, less surgical site infection, less estimate blood loss, less areas and shorter hospital stay. So I can't blame it when the colorectal surgeon beat everybody bushes just to see, can I borrow your robot? And then lastly, Dr. Tan looked at over the last 30 years and anything he can figure out between robotic surgery open and MIS. And the conclusion is that regardless of your specialty and procedure type, Robot surgery show a decrease in both the EBL and the need for transfusion compared to the other approach. In addition, it has a shorter length of stay and a lower overall complication. This is the data that released by intuitive surgery predicted the growth of robotic surgery for the, for the last few years. And you can see the average is 15% per year. <coughs> So it's just like if you ever travel in Japan, the train will leave with or without you on time. <laughs> okay, That's for the resident. For those of us who would rather walk, that's a different story. So the question is that should we simply have a robotic survey training on the standard curriculum? The reality is that uh, most of our surgeons in this institution are actually 
have favorite in robotic surgery. We have the expertise available. We do have a mix of cases that can be complex and high volume to offer to the resident. The resident always learn, love to learn something new. I can't speak for them now, but I remember 30 years ago, Dr. Kutnai and Dr. Hundo probably remember in 1990 when they first come out with the lab coli. We took the, the video tape, show it to Dr. Wolf, and ask him to do it, and he managed to find somebody to do it. And I recall Dr. Ballastella, one of my fellow medical student, resident, and faculty, and he presented the first grand round on a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It took 12 hours to do the case. <laughs> but then, and that's how, and that's from the resident, we all resident at that time, but we were pushing for it. So I'm pretty sure you have put in for that. But lastly, uh, my feeling is that if you want to recruit the best, you need to offer the best. And for the resident, you can say that, oh, let's just finish this and I'll get training uh, after I'm done. Let me tell you what, when I get interested in having some training in robotic surgery and then check out with them, it costs you about $6,000 just to have two-day training. Just the first day is to get trained, what Amanda gonna tell you or beg you to go train, free, $3,000. Then you have to go back to get trained for a specific procedure that they want to. And, and when you ask for funding, I just say, hey, with it, I'll, I'll pay for it. But then I make an argument with them that I need somebody to popularize this, this system. So the deal was they allow me to take a fellow with me, which is Dr. Ruby. He's in Kaiser now. So it's a 50% discount, uh, and Ruby got it free. So, don't think that when you get out there, you can get it done when you have it free here. Um, what's going on now? There's a web-based study showed up on ISIC program in our country, state robotic surgery training is important. 92% of them have resident participated in the cases, 84% at the council, 70% have a formal training curriculum, but the requirement for those are very, and 44% track the resident experience, but uh, about half of them give a formal recognition. And, and that is uh, equal between university affiliated or an independent program. So people are moving, and if we want to join them, we join them. Let me skip this, but there's a national uh, efforts to establish a fundamental of robotic surgery which is similar to the laparoscopic surgery and on the program director gonna shake in the head now because it's another unfunded mandate to come. On the other hand, OBGYN is way ahead of the curve. They already have one done, okay? And I'm pretty sure we will. And this is the thing that they're gonna look through. I wouldn't bother you with the detail. Um, so, cost. So if I casually mention that, people are gonna just say, why don't I just open it and get it over with? It costs less. Why don't you just do it laparoscopic? You don't have to wait for the special, uh, equipment specialist to roll the robot in and argue where to go and so and so. Well, it is true that it costs more. It takes longer time to do a cholecystectomy and it costs on the average 400 bucks. Inguinal hernia, twice the time, uh, and then uh, $800 more. This is the instrument cost, basically. And ventral hernia, similarly. So the question is, can you do it with all costs? Um, and then you add the resident on, on it, that even worse. The reality is there is a study show that with or without resident participation, in robotic laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, there is no difference. So rest assured, we're not gonna blame you guys if you decide to participate, that you prolong the case, unless you come unprepared. And that 
the same whether or not you do an open lipoma resection of breast lung excision with anybody. You don't you don't come unprepared, please. All right, so how we do that? Um, first of all, UC Davis does have a robotic surgery committee with a very rigid standard. You have to be proctored specifically for robot. You have to maintain your expertise. Every two years, if you don't do enough of it, you lose the, the thing and you have to be reproctored. The good news is that of, of all the surgeons who are interested in robotic surgery in our institution, they all qualify and fully go through the proctor. Uh, I don't know how I walked in the, the wrong time. So I was appointed to be the one who reinforced that. So I guess that a lot of people dislike me for that, but anyway. <laughs> All right. The robotic uh, curriculum is currently available, and Dr. Ferris is going to talk about it. There's a lot of things that I can wreck the, study, uh, the, the talk out, whether or not the hospital actually support it, whether or not we have dedicated all our time, and whether or not we have physician extender, I will leave it to the specialty people. All of these are valid, and, but I don't have any say on it. Back in 2015, when we still have the SGI service where we have an intern, a junior, and a senior resident, Dr. Carr and I cook up this plan just for robotic in our group, where you can see that as you move along, you're going to do all these things, and by the time you are the senior chief resident, you should be able to go back and remember all these things, help the resident, assist the attendant, and have the attendant review the five case for the skill and competency assessment. Um, before we go further, thing change, so then it's difficult to implement that. So it's kind of sit on the side for now. So, now, be sensible to the resident feeling. I, I used to be a resident when they introduced laparoscopic surgery. So I know the feeling, but I'm not sure I do the same approach. First of all, if you say the case is going to be a robotic case, there's going to be a denial from the resident. Why? No way. And then some would get anger. You, you can tell. So, Please don't do that, okay? <laughs> Especially don't hook Dr. Salcido by your evaluation. It's meant to be good for you. You just think about what you can do for $6,000 at the current rate and get it free. If something offers free for you and you don't want it, that's your choice. But don't get back on the residency training program. We put it out there to give you an opportunity. Some other residents are very, very polite, so they decide to isolate themselves somewhere in the corner, or they turn on the pager somehow that they need to go and resuscitate somebody <laughs> in the SICU service, <laughs> where they are on my service, which is practically, the, the, just like they show the casement index went down, poof, do like nothing, right? Uh, other decided that Dr. Ho just messed up the discharge order, so they go back to the EMR in the corner and we do everything. Uh, that's probably a bad thing. If you go to the OR, stick to the case, learn something. But the bottom line, uh, I got it from Dr. John Porterfield in uh, UAB, and he shared the same thing. It's just that he's the program director. So he see the evaluation and he shared it to me. I'm not a program director, but I can speak just in case you guys tempted to do that. Do not, please. Anyway, we are thinking about you guys. So we actually, every time we negotiate everything, we ask for, we buy the dual console, which costs more. Which means that you can, if you qualify, you can sit there, operate, and the attendant can be next to you and guide you, or you can actually learn by propose what to do next. We also have a simulator for every generation in the hospital. And you can see this poor thing sit there, 
not even hook up, which means it's barely used. Uh, that simulator costs a lot of money. If you can look here, all the things in the market, the one for Da Vinci, a total cost is $500,000. So we make a lot of investment waiting for you guys to take care of it. It's just like the little Ferrari that daddy parked in the garage and you don't even bother to take the license so that you can drive it. Is that? <laughs> Day off of Peter's bus or whatever, that movie, the guy who took out the Ferrari and crashed it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> please do not crash it. It's only $500,000. All right. The simulator are really good, but I do not want to talk further more about it. Together with the new purchase, we have a new training program also uh, by Da Vinci named SimNow. And with that, I would like to yield the podium to Dr. Ferris so that she can do the dirty work on the resident. All right, good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Dr. Ho for the invitation to come and share this information with all of you and for the kind introduction. I also will say that I have no financial disclosures related to the company or corporation. I'm not receiving any funding for presenting this. Um, to give you a little bit of information here, oh, maybe. So the University of California Robotics Collaborative was established in 2016. It includes members from Davis, San Francisco, Irvine, Riverside, UCLA, and UC San Diego. And at the time that they developed, that they started, they developed a robotics training curriculum that, with the goal to be used by all of the different surgical subspecialties that perform robotic surgery. And so just out of curiosity, faculty in the room, who performs robotic surgery currently? <laughs> okay. Excellent. How many faculty and residents were aware that we had a UC-wide established robotics curriculum program for residents? Good. Okay. And out of the residents, who's performed live robotic surgery? Okay. How many at this hospital? Okay. All right. Excellent. Good. Okay. So the objectives of the training program um, were to teach advantages and disadvantages of robotic surgery, understand the basic components of the system, recognize the patient's safety issues related to robotic surgery, learn how to do the docking, how to take care of the equipment, how to assist in the procedure, and then to become comfortable with manipulating the robotic instruments. Here's an overview of the program that we have. It's divided up into stages. It includes web-based and in-person training, simulation, and ultimately ending in live robotic surgery. For the first stage, the didactic information includes basic knowledge needed for performing robotic surgery. and includes articles divided by specialties. So there's articles for all specialties, general surgery, OB-GYN, neurology. It also includes online modules. So these can be found on the Da Vinci Surgery Community website. You log in and create an account. Um, and then there will be online training modules that are specific to <coughs> our robotic models that we have here. They include overview of the system, the different components, docking, safety features, uh, techniques, camera manipulation, and patient positioning. Once you have completed all of those, you can actually get a certificate from the website, and then that will allow you to move on to the next phase, which is the dry lab or the bedside um, opportunities. So the Dr. Najad, who's one of the GYN faculty, uh, typically tries to arrange two dry labs a year where Intuitive actually comes, brings extra training equipment and extra training staff and, and holds sessions where residents and team members can come down and practice working with the equipment. And so you get the opportunity to learn all of those bedside and docking techniques and then once you're completed that, you can move on to working with the actual simulator. They've identified a number of exercises that are the required exercises to complete the curriculum. And for all of these, you have to score at least 90% um, to pass. As Dr. Ho mentioned, we're in the process of acquiring SIM now. So with the purchase of the new models that we bought, they threw in this new software package uh, as part of our training. Currently, if you guys have tried to go down and work with the trainer that's in the skills lab, there isn't really any way to save your data. So you do a module, you have to take a screenshot of it in order to show somebody that you got a certain score. It's a little bit difficult to manage, especially then if you're 
training at different sites or moving around, it can be difficult. So Sim now has moved all of the uh, profiles online. So each resident will have a profile that tracks their progress. And so when you log in, any work that you do will be saved and it'll all be saved in an app. And so when you go anywhere on any site, you can show somebody the app and say, hey, I've completed these modules, these are my scores. It'll just be a lot easier to kind of keep track of. Um, Sim now, the software is specific to the actual trainer itself. So we have one that sits in the skills lab. We have two backpacks that are on the um, consoles that we have in the operating room, and I'm not sure if we're getting a third backpack with our third unit or not, um, but the software is specific to the actual unit. So even if you go to another site, if they don't have the software, you won't be able to, to log in and use it. You can just use the regular old training modules that exist. But anywhere that has the package, your profile will follow you, and you can take it and train. Okay. Then the last part of the curriculum would be if you complete greater than 50% of 20 cases during residency, you will receive a competency letter at graduation. So this is a letter that then you could take to your next hospital credentialing board to say that you received robotic training during your program, and they may or may not accept that as uh, to give you privileges at that hospital. Now, the other thing I will mention is that uh, upcoming we will be doing a project looking at this UC-wide robotics curriculum. So it's led by Dr. Lisa Perry at UC San Diego and funded by an ASCRIS grant. We're looking at the number of residents who are able to complete this program during residency and then also tracking trainee satisfaction, score reports from the simulators, interoperative evaluation scores, and then time uh, of surgery reports. Uh, we are just getting this kicked off. We're going to look at all the different UC sites, and we'll be enrolling residents sometime over the next year. So more, more on that to come. Uh, and I can take any questions about the curriculum. I'll post all this information on the Google Drive as well, so residents have access to the full program, what modules are required. And as soon as we get that new software, I'll make sure that everybody has logins and everybody can access it. Okay. Yes? No one we're getting new software? It's supposed to be in the next couple months. But I don't know exactly. Dr. Najad doesn't have a time nailed down from Intuitive yet. But we have negotiated the purchase of the two new units, and that came with, with that. We might, we might know by tomorrow night. The meeting is tomorrow night for us to discuss what to do with that. One thing I want to mention is that the schedule for this year is April 15 to April 19. Mm -hmm. and you may want to discuss with your attendees to have at least a day or half a day off to participate in that. Um, the last time when we went down there last year, the majority are OBGYN and urology, and um, we have a few of us who are interested, but uh, it's hard to convince the uh, faculty to take the day off to sit there and do nothing. So please consider that. That, that's going to be the next time that Intuitive is coming with a big training event, so they'll have their equipment here for that entire week. We'll probably try to schedule block sessions for the different residency programs where people can come in and get that training. Uh, what, the, the reason for that is not regular training that you do with the rep or myself or Amanda or on your own. When they will talk in the whole system for that, and as I remember the last time we talking about it, that's almost like a $200,000 donation that they give, and they don't give it to every single university. We one of the few that for some how they found us that they decide to give that. So it's quite an opportunity for us, and please take it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Farkas, any comments? I know one of the larger users of robots in the institution. Yes, yeah, so um, <coughs> into the residency education has been a challenge for all of you.
So I'm going to do it. The reason the collaborative effort has been done is twofold. Number one is to protect the university and the faculty, and number two, to protect the resident. So if you don't have documentation of proper training, and for some reason I like you and let you do it, and there's a complication, none of us have any leg to stand because there's proof that you fail and you still get to do. So that is to protect the system and the faculty. On the other hand, if you qualify and you have proof and I just don't like you and wouldn't let you do it, then that's not fair to you. So you have to look at it both ways. So for the resident, please understand that is the basic requirement for you to practice on a human being and don't take it lightly. For the faculty, I want to reinforce thing is that the senior faculty, the chief of the division are responsible for implementation of this. And please do not play the popular attendant candidate award stuff. You cannot let a resident who not qualify to do the case anywhere. But when you do an open surgery or laparoscopic surgery, there's no proof. So you, you can fuss around with it and nobody going to document anything. But remember, it's now computerized national system. So your name will be on it and don't, don't take a chance. Because I understand a lot of people just kind of like, okay, let's do that and then make the supervisor in trouble. That's the white elephant. I want to thank you all for the slightly late hour and for your attention and for a wonderful summary of a complicated educational program.